It is our privilege for the very first time at Because of the Times to have a revivalist. Brother Randy Keyes, a man who probably has one of the fastest growing churches in the United Pentecostal Church. And I thank God for his love for souls. And I want him and Sister Keyes to know that we are very honored that they have come to be with us at Because of the Times. Would you welcome Brother Randy Keyes? He is, he is preaching a message that the KIP committee has requested him to preach. And he'll tell you about that. Worship God with him tonight as he preaches the word. Shall we all clap our hands again unto the Lord and let's give him great praise. Let's praise him with all of our hearts. Let's fill this house with praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Certainly a joy and a pleasure to be a part of this conference. And if you will allow me tonight, <clears throat> I will make my preliminary remarks very brief for the sake of time, uh, but it is certainly a joy and a pleasure to be here. I want to say that we greatly appreciate our General Superintendent, Brother Urshan, appreciate Brother Tenney, the District Superintendent, and his blessing on my participation in this conference, and uh, we give honor to Brother Kilgore, who has been so kind to myself to our family for so long. And uh, <clears throat> brother and sister Elder, or G.A. Mangan, have been such a blessing to me throughout my life. Little do they know that I was just a child when they traveled to California and preached conferences and helped instill in my heart the convic conviction that we can have New Testament apostolic revival in our day. And um, Brother Sister Anthony Mangan, I am just so impressed with how efficiently this entire conference is taking place. I, am, I know something about what it takes to, to put something like this on and bring something like this to pass. And I am absolutely amazed at the efficiency, the competency, and uh, just all that is being done to make this a very, very successful time. We appreciate them and their extreme uh, gestures of hospitality they have shown. Uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed genuine Southern hospitality the last couple of days. It's good to be here, and I think everybody in the house can say that tonight. We heard tremendous preaching last night. We heard tremendous preaching last night, and somebody ought to say amen. amen. And then today, I don't know when I have spent a more glorious day in the presence of God. I don't know when I have been moved more deeply, and uh, I, I am convinced that I came in the will of God, not so much for what I am going to say tonight, but for what I received today. I will never be the same. And I thank God for what happened in these services today. Do you thank the Lord for what he's doing? Would you like to just lift your hands and offer thanksgiving to him? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord, Jesus. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. And the music and singing, I, I'm telling you, I just stand in awe, but especially tonight. I don't want to date myself, but this is the first time in a while, even at home, that I can remember knowing all the words to all the songs.
I'd invite you to open your Bibles tonight to the book of Ephesians chapter number 3. Ephesians chapter number 3, and I might say the committee did ask if I could feel direction and feel good about preaching this message, if I would do so. However, they did give me complete liberty to preach anything I wanted to preach. And so, I want that to be clear tonight. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth the length the depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, unto him that is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above, all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I would like to direct your attention particularly tonight to the 20th verse. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding, everybody say exceeding. exceeding. Abundantly, everybody say abundantly. Abundant. Above, everyone say above. above. All that we ask or Now say think. Now I know that's not the most popular word or activity in an apostolic service. But we're going to focus our attention on that word tonight. Sometimes you are able to announce a title that is catchy. And in merely announcing the title, you capture the attention of the entire congregation. Other times you simply have to tell them what you're going to preach about. Well, this happens to be one of those nights that I just have to tell you what I'm going to preach about and hope that I can have your attention from the onset. I want to preach to you tonight about thinking, which facilitates revival. Thinking, which facilitates revival. Would you pray with me that God would do his perfect will in this place? Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight for this great opportunity to come here to this place and to worship and honor you. I pray, dear Jesus, that you'll let your spirit flow like a river in this place. I depend completely and solely upon you. I trust you now, God, to give me wisdom and to grant me words. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will allow me access to the minds and the hearts of all who are in this place. I pray, O oh God, that you'll do a mighty work for your glory and for the honor of your name, Jesus. I pray these things and I ask you these things in your most wonderful and powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Clap your hands and give praise to the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. You may be seated. Ephesians chapter 2 and chapter 3 have always been two of my most favorite chapters in the entire New Testament. Most of you recognize from my reading that this passage of Scripture is the conclusion of a prayer the Apostle Paul prayed. In particular, the verse of Scripture we have chosen to focus on tonight is a part of the conclusion of this beautiful prayer. And the apostle gives us these words that many of you can recite from memory. Uh, now unto him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly 
above all that we ask or think. This word think is not intended to convey some wild imagination. This word think is not intended to convey some fantasy or some dream that you do not really think is possible. But the word think in this passage of Scripture is intended to convey the meaning, the perimeters of what you really think God can do. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or we really think He can do. Those things that are within the perimeters that we think God has the power to accomplish and to bring to pass. Now, I want to say early in this message tonight, what I am not preaching. I have discovered that in preaching, sometimes it is as important to say what you're not preaching as it is to preach what you're preaching. Because we have some people who are masters at reading between the lines. Even when there is nothing between the lines. So I want you to know tonight I am not preaching the power of positive thinking. I am not preaching tonight think and grow rich. Those are concepts that speak of the potential of humanity. But I'm not preaching tonight about the potential of humanity. I have come tonight to preach to you about the potential of our God. The God who has all power in heaven and in earth. It's His ability I'm interested in tonight. It's not what I can do, what you can do, what anybody else can do. But I want to present to you tonight what God can do. We are serving a great big God tonight. Oh, what a God we are serving. I think if we just took time tonight to to contemplate on the greatness of the God whom we are worshiping in this place tonight, uh, we could spend the rest of the evening just giving Him glory and honor. I say to you again tonight, uh, we're serving a great big God. We're serving an all-powerful God. We're serving a God who knows no impossibility. We're serving a God who can do anything. Oh, what a God we serve tonight. Oh, what a God we're praising in this place. I wish you'd clap your hands and give him honor right now. Praise God. I want you to note that the apostle did not say that our God would do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. He did not say he would do exceeding and abundantly above all we ask or think because probably he will not. Most of the time he doesn't. Now all of us have enjoyed pleasant surprises in our lives when God has miraculously, supernaturally come on the scene when we didn't expect Him to, He surprised us with a miracle. He did something for us we never even thought that He might do. How many have enjoyed that kind of a surprise? Those are very blessed times and occasions in our lives. But I tell you tonight, most of what we receive from God comes because we ask Him for it. And we ask Him for it in faith. As a matter of fact, that's the plan that He gave to us. He taught us much and often in the New Testament about asking and seeking. He taught us to ask in faith whatever we desire to ask and to believe. He taught us to ask and we would receive. 
But the apostle in this passage of scripture takes the step by which we receive miraculous intervention in our lives one step further back. He starts with the thought. As a matter of fact, uh, the procedure or the process is given to us in three words in this 20th verse. Now unto him that is able to do. Everybody say do. How many enjoy it when God does something for you? I like to see God do things. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask. Everybody say ask. Most of what he does we ask for. But Paul takes it one step further back in the process. He said ask or think. You see the petition or the act of asking begins first of all with a thought. If you never think of it, you never ask God for it. You have to think of it before you ask God for it. It's born as a thought in your mind. I think God can do this. And because I think God can do it, I believe I'll ask Him for it. And when you ask Him for it in faith, then miraculous intervention comes into our life and our circumstance. And we enjoy the great supernatural blessing of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. But it's born in a thought. It begins with a thought. Paul didn't say that God would do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or think because he probably will not. It first of all has to be thought of and then asked for in faith. Can you say amen? amen? In my life and ministry, I have made it a practice to observe the blessed. And in my study of the scripture, I have made it a practice whenever I come across a passage that says, blessed is the man. Or, blessed are they. Somebody said that just means happy is the man. No, it means more than that. It means favored is that man. Favored is that person. Blessed is that individual. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, uh, but I want to be favored of God. I want God's favors in my life. I want God's blessing in my life. Brother Wayne Huntley got up here today and accused Brother Pugh of stealing from his message and then unabashedly proceeded to read from my notes. God's not a socialist. God's not a communist. And whether you like it or not, whether it fits uh, uh, your democratic concept of how things ought to be. God has favorites. God has blessed ones. There are blessed ones amongst us. I'm not getting many amens out of that, but there's some of you to whom I am preaching that are more blessed than others. I've watched it in my congregation. I have seen them endure the same trials. This family that sits on this pew and this family that sits on that pew go through the same series of circumstances. And this family come through with flying colors and the rich, glorious, wondrous blessings of God abounding in their lives. And watch this family throw in the towel, give up and get angry and bitter with God and turn their back on the church and go out and see their homes and families torn and ravaged by by the devil and no sign of the blessing of the Lord in their lives. What is the difference? There are some keys. There are some differences you would be wise to search for. There are some reasons for the blessing. And one of the things I've noted about people that are blessed of God is whenever they face a difficulty, Whenever they face a challenge, whenever they encounter an adverse circumstance, they think God is big enough, powerful enough, 
wise enough to see them through. They think he can do it. Some people don't think God can get them through their little dilemma. And you can spend all day long trying to convince them that God can do it. But you'll not convince them. They don't think God can handle their problem. But those other folks, the devil can tell them all day long. They're through, they're finished, it's over with, it's hopeless. And they'll look the devil and every demon in hell in the eye and say, I think my God's big enough. I think he has the answer. I think he has the solution. I think he can see me through. I think he can do it. I think he can do it. Come on, shout aloud to the Lord and give him praise. Hallelujah. You got to think right. I said you got to think right. You may be seated. 90% of faith's victory starts in the mind. Faith begins in the mind. I think God can do this. And that thought passes down through the corners of the heart. And joins with the spirit. The spirit transforms that thought into faith. Faith rises up and lays hold of the hem of the garment and hangs on until virtue flows and the miracle happens. But it started in the mind. It started with, I think, I think God can do it. I think he can do it. I think my God can handle this. I think my God can get me through this. Clap your hands again to the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Before you're seated, shake somebody's hand and say, I think he can. I think he can. I think he can. My goodness, I feel the Holy Ghost here right now. My God, I feel his presence in this place. You walked into this place tonight. Maybe it was a word that somebody spoke. You may be seated. Maybe it was a song that somebody sang. Maybe it was just the atmosphere of the service. But you walked in here tonight and something has happened to you in the course of the service. And your mind is saying now, I think I can get the Holy Ghost. I think I can get the Holy Ghost. You're 90% of the way there. I'm surprised you're not talking in tongues already. I think I can get the Holy Ghost tonight. I think I can get it tonight. You walked in here with a, uh, an affliction, with an illness. And something about the power of God's presence has caused you to think, I think I can get healed tonight. I think I can get my healing tonight. I think this is the night I may get rid of my sugar diabetes. I think this may be the night I get rid of my high blood pressure. I, I think this might be the night. You're 90% of the way to your miracle right now. Hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Our mentality, our thinking, or the perimeters of our thinking are the only limitations God knows in working with his people. Whether it's here tonight, whether it's in the church you pastor, whether it's in the revivals you minister in as an evangelist, if it be on the foreign field, I tell you tonight, the only limitations that our God knows is how we think. Don't tell me the devil's big enough to stop my God. Don't tell me that the circumstances of this world have bound and hindered my God. Don't even try to tell me there's something wrong with our doctrine. I don't even have time to talk to you. 
Don't even try to tell me that our holiness standards are a hindrance to the move of God. I don't believe it for one second. My God's bigger than that. Those things do not hinder my God. The only thing that stands between us and everything God would like to do for us is the way we think. You can be seated. Jesus walked into Nazareth, went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. He had done it many times previously. There was nothing so much new about his visit on this day. But he did say, I want to read from the book of Isaiah on that occasion. He read from Isaiah's prophecies about the Messiah that was to come. And then he looked around at all of them that were in the house and said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. In so many words, he said, Isaiah said he was coming. But I stopped by church on this Sunday morning to tell you that I'm here. Oh, what a momentous day. The Messiah had come. The Redeemer of Israel was in their midst. All of the fulfillments of prophecy could have transpired in his hometown, Nazareth, on that Sunday morning. And yet the scripture tells us that he left that town having done no great work, only having healed a few sick folks. And the reason was they thought, they thought, they thought this is just Joseph's son. It wasn't the devil. It wasn't immorality. It wasn't vile, wicked sin in their lives. It wasn't a lack of obedience. The reason he left that place and they didn't have revival in Nazareth was because they thought it was their thought life that hindered Jesus. He left that place having done no great work because they thought he was just Joseph's son. I preach to you tonight the only chains on his hands. I preach to you tonight the only hindrance that stands before him in the United Pentecostal Church, the apostolic movement. The only thing that hinders us at this point from turning our world upside down is the way we think we've got the right doctrine. We've got the right lifestyle. We've got the right fellowship. We've got all the right ingredients. God, somehow, help us on this night help us with the way we think shake somebody's hand and say I think he can please be seated what time did I praise God praise God praise God hallelujah hallelujah let me quickly reiterate to you, most of you are preachers or Bible scholars of some sort, so I don't have to tell you the whole story, but let me reiterate that occasion to you quickly when the little wid widow came to Elisha. And she said, my husband's died. She was a preacher's wife. And her husband had died. And now she had no means to pay the bills. And the creditors were coming. And she said, what shall I do? Elisha said, what do you have in your house? She said, I've just got a little vessel of oil. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to all your neighbors. And I want you to ask them for vessels. And bring them back to your house. And don't ask for just a few. You know, that's where we, we have problems. A few to us is a whole lot different than a few to God. Hallelujah. Ethiopia's only got a few saved, Brother Teclamary. I believe in God's eyes, only a few have gotten the Holy Ghost in Ethiopia. Boy, you're getting quiet now. You're getting quiet now. You know why? That's why our problem is. The way we think. He said, don't go get just one or two. 
Don't get just a few. You can be seated. I imagine she sent the boys out that were going to be taken as, as payment for the bills. She sent them out. Maybe it was Benjamin and Joseph. She sent them out. Go get the vessels. And they went around to all the neighbor's house. And they asked vessels of all the neighbors. I don't know when it was. Are you listening to me? I don't know when it was they decided they had enough. Maybe it was after they had 12. Maybe they had 20. Maybe they had 100. I don't know how many they got. But at some point, they decided that that was probably as big a miracle as God could do. They couldn't think that God could do something bigger than 25. And so they brought the vessels back. Little did they know, when they decided they had enough, they had set the limitation on the miracle. You didn't hear me. When they thought they had enough, they had set the perimeters of how big the miracle was going to be. They brought the vessels into the house. Mother began to pour the oil in the vessels. When she had filled them all, the Bible said, she said, is there another one? And they said, no, Mom, that's all we got. And the oil stayed. I preached to you tonight, uh, if that I had a hundred more, that I filled up a hundred more of them. If that I had a thousand more, God had run out of oil. God wasn't finished. They just thought that was enough. And with their thinking, they determined the limitation of a miracle. Yeah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise the name of the Lord. God help us. God enlarge the capacity of how we feel and believe and think about God. We're often the victims of our own peers' mentality. We usually accept the limitations of their thinking. I said we're the victims of our peers' mentality. We are the beneficiaries of many things from our peers. But we're the victims of their mentality. If you think it's big, I think it's big. I get my idea of what's big from you. And then I pass along my idea of what is a lot to you. And you pass along that same thought to him. And he passes it back to him and back to me. And pretty soon we've made a vicious circle. And we think a hundred in Sunday school's a lot. And we think a church of a thousand is huge. And we think 2,000 is a big thing for God. Where did we get that? We sure didn't get it out of the New Testament. We sure didn't get it from God's Bible. Where did we get that kind of thinking? We got it from one another. And we judge ourselves amongst ourselves. And we think what's big and what's good because of what brother thinks is big and good. Let me tell you, our God's bigger than you ever thought him to be. God's bigger than we've ever dreamed he is. I'm convinced there were 50,000 believers in the city of Jerusalem. I'm convinced there were 85,000 tongue-talking Holy Ghost-filled children of God in the city of Ephesus. They turned their city upside down. I don't think a hundred's very many. I don't think a thousand's very many. I don't think 2,000's very big. No, don't get quiet on me now. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to put you down. I'm here to try to help you in the name of the Lord. Loose your thinking and understand God can do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or think. Come on, clap your hands again. I feel God in this place. Hallelujah. You may be seated. I'm hurrying now.
the only way, the only way we'll get past this present dilemma, the only way we can extradite ourselves or escape from a thought pattern, number one, it takes a work of the Spirit. Yeah, beha behavioral patterns are very difficult to change. Habits. Habits are hard to change. But you can break a habit. You can change a habit. Varying degrees of difficulty depending on the habit and the addiction. But you can change behavioral patterns. Thought patterns take a work of the Spirit. If you're not willing to stay full of the Holy Ghost and talk in tongues every day of your life, Got a little quiet there. I had a, a brother wanted to talk to me about that one time. He said, do you really believe everybody needs to talk in tongues every day? Or he was talking about another gentleman who had preached that, another brother. And, and uh, I said, well, for me, one time's not enough. If you're not willing to let the Holy Ghost have free reign and control in your life, you'll never extradite yourself from long-standing thought patterns. You'll think about it the way you think about it till the day you die. But the Holy Ghost can help you change the way you think. So first of all, it takes a work of the Spirit. Secondly, Somebody has to challenge our mentality. Somebody has to challenge the way we think. It was a dark and dismal time in Israel's history. Saul had already gone into the place of the priesthood and Samuel had denounced him and rebuked him and predicted his demise. And Israel was hiding in caves and dungeons, afflicted by the Philistines. And Jonathan, Jonathan, got to thinking. Just doesn't seem like it ought to be like this. We're God's people. We're God's people. We are the chosen. Do you feel that way tonight? Do you feel that the Jesus name baptized Holy Ghost filled people are the children of God? We're God's people. Just doesn't seem right that we're hiding back here in dens and caves and dungeons and oppressed and beat down. We're a nothing and we're a nobody. It just doesn't seem right if we're God's people. Think what you want, friend. That New Testament church was a powerful force in the earth. Think what you want. They affected the decision of the governments and the course of human history. Those one God, Jesus, name, tongue-talking people. This doesn't seem right. We ought to be meeting over here on the back side of the tracks and nobody knows who we are and where we are and what's going on with us and what our message is. Doesn't seem right. We are the people of God. I don't know about you, but I don't think that's right. I think that in this end time, God is going to elevate His church to a position of power and influence in this world. They're going to know who we are. They're going to know what we stand for. They're going to know how we live. They're going to know what we believe. That's why it's so important you believe it. Jonathan, please be seated. Jonathan got to thinking. Elder Kilgore got to think, this don't seem right. If I had about 10,000 men, I'd go fix those Philistines. I'd take care of this. He got to thinking. Well, it's really God that does it anyway, so I wouldn't need 10,000. If I just had five, if I just had five, we'd turn this situation around. Well, 
God and me and 5,000. Really, God and me and 1,000 could do it. And he thought on. You know what? If it's God... Maybe God and me and a couple hundred could do it. And he thought about it some more. He got to thinking about how big God is. That's what we need to do. I said we need to think more about how big God is. Don't tell me he can't do it. If he can't do it, it's because you don't think he can do it. Don't tell me you can't have revival in your city. If you can't have revival in your city, it's because you don't think you can have revival in your city. Don't tell me we can't have revival in 1998. If we don't have it, it's because we don't think we can. I think we can. I think we can. I think we can turn the world upside down. I think we can have the biggest churches in our city. I think we can. I think he's big enough. I think he's got the answers. I think he can give us direction. I think he can lead us. I think he can anoint us. I think he can give us power. I think he can. I think he can. You don't think he can? I don't want to talk to you. My faith is too precious. It's taking too long to get it to the place it is. I won't let you steal it. I think he can. I think he can. Come on, let the Holy Ghost move in this place right now. Somebody get the Holy Ghost right now. Somebody get a miracle right now. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, he can. I'm finished with my notes. Go ahead and stand up. I don't have time to get finished with my notes anyway. Please stand up. Clap your hands and worship the Lord. I think he can. I think he can. I think he can. I think he can. I think he can give you a revival. I know he can. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jonathan. Thought this thing through real good. In the name of the Lord. Go. Yes. And he said, you know what? I don't think I even need a hundred. I don't think if it's God and me, I even need a dozen. He said, armor bearer. You know what I think? He really don't meet, need me and you. Or you and I. You folks helping me preach, use proper English up here. You and I. He's just going to include us because he's going to let us in on the action. He can really do it all by himself. But he loves us enough to include us in on what he's about to do. But... No Philistine army is a real problem for God. And God brought deliverance to Israel because Jonathan challenged the thinking of the Israelites. What we need, we need somebody to rise up and say, I think God's big enough. When revival breaks out in your brother's city, he gets a revelation of how big God is. He gets to thinking and believing that God is able to give him a genuine New Testament apostolic Holy Ghost revival. And he starts having it just because you don't think God can do it in your city. Don't get jealous of him. You need him to challenge your thinking. 
As a matter of fact, you need him to come stick his finger in your chest and say, you know what, my brother? God can do it in your city. God can do it in your church. God can give you a revival like you have never experienced. God can do it for you. When I get to feeling what I'm feeling right now, Helder Mangan, I feel a Holy Ghost anger. I am so angry with the devil for pawning off on us thoughts and ideas and concepts about what we can have and can't have and what we can do and what we can't do. And we let the devil get by with it. We let him pawn it off on us. God help us. God send us somebody to challenge the way we think. I'm telling you, United Pentecostal churches ought to be the biggest churches in the city. That's the way it ought to be. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost. i got about five minutes, I think. But I feel like God wants me to speak directly to somebody. Hallelujah. There's some of you right here, right now, God's are talking to. Something stirring in your heart that hasn't for a long time. You came here despondent, beat down by the devil, believing his lies. But something is happening in your mind. And you're saying, I wonder if I could go home and have a real revival. I wonder if I think that might could happen. Maybe God is big enough. I've come to tell you in the name of the Lord Jesus. There are men in this building who if you'll get a hold of what I'm preaching to you right now, your churches will double in the next 12 months. If you don't think it's going to happen, it won't happen. But if you think it can happen, it can happen. There's some hundred soul revivals in the next 30 days represented right here in this building. Some 100 soul revivals in the next 30 days represented right here in this building. You say, I don't think so, Brother Keys. Well, then just stay where you're at. There's a brother standing next to you that says, I think I can see, I think it could. I think it could happen. I'm going to go home and get with it. I think it can happen. I've listened to the negativism, the unbelief, the lies of the enemy as long as I shall. I think my God can do it. Brother Anthony Mayan, we're going to ask some churches in the end time, not for our glory, not so that our name might be lifted up. No, a thousand times no. You understand, you're well past that. The glamour is not so attractive. But I'm telling you, we're going to have some churches in our end time of tens of thousands of Jesus' name, one good God tongue-talking people in North America. I said in North America. Some of you don't think so, but some of you think it could happen. Some of you think it's going to be... We don't need a bigger God. We don't need another Bible. We don't need another doctrine. Nobody can teach us how to worship better. We don't need to change our lifestyle. You know what we need? We need a bunch of people that think God is big enough. He is able. Everybody say He is able. Say he is able. Say he is able. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Clap your hands to the Lord and let the Holy Ghost touch you.